So when I began to record this video, it was supposed to originally be one long video that would go over both the proof for the existence of God and then the divine attributes, which show why this being is God, because that's how SCOTUS sets up the proof. Ultimately, after recording the first half of this video, I found that it was already an hour long and there was already a lot of content, so I've decided to break it into two parts. So this week I'll release this first half, which has been recorded, assuming it was going to be one long video, and then two weeks from now the other half will come out about the Divine Attributes. So I hope you enjoy this half. Hello and welcome to the Byzantine Scotist. Today will be the first in a series of videos introducing the philosophy and theology of Blessed John Dun Scotus. Now when we say Scotism, this is really just shorthand for the Franciscan school of theology. So it isn't really just represented by Scotus, but especially by Alexander of Hales, by St. Bonaventure, and then going on forward to many wonderful commentators such as Parthenio Minguez, Claude Frassen, St. Maximilian Kolbe, St. Lawrence of Brindisi, Venerable Mary of Agreda, just to name a few. There's many more commentators there. Within this large tradition of Scotism, and so when we say Scotism, this is really just shorthand for the Franciscan School of Theology. And the wonderful thing about Scotism is it allows us to take the entire earlier tradition, I think, and synthesize it into a coherent whole. So Scotus is often pointed to as a major departure from the earlier tradition to which either Aquinas or Palamas is faithful, depending on whether you follow the East or the West on this. But what I think if you actually really grasp what Scotus is saying, he's able to answer the objections of both the Palamites and the Thomists, and is able to actually take what the fathers say on their own terms and integrate it. So just because you don't see lots and lots of patristic citations within Scotus himself, that doesn't mean his ideas aren't deeply rooted in the fathers. Rather, you have to take into account the fact that Scotus was living in the late 13th and early 14th century in England and France. And at that time, there were particular debates going on that, to which Scotus entered into. And once you understand that context, you understand the way he writes and the reason he writes that way. But when you really take a step back and look at his whole system as a whole, which is often not done, You'll see a great beauty within it and a great harmony it has, especially with Bonaventure, but then also with the fathers, both East and West, and he's able to take the insights of both and integrate them so that there genuinely is a mind of the fathers. And so I think this is why Scotus is so useful to study. If we really grasp what Scotus is saying, we'll begin to understand the fabric of reality in a different way. And... This is also then what scripture teaches us. As I'm going through on my series in scripture, as I did last week in the video on interpreting the Bible, I talked about a typological way of viewing all of reality. And this is the same thing with Scotism. Scotus gives us the underlying metaphysics necessary to explain our biblical theology. And so while Scotus isn't necessarily citing lots and lots of Bible passages, he's talking about the same things in an Aristotelian language. And so that's why it's so important to understand the fathers, to understand scripture, but then also to understand the scholastics, and especially Bonaventure and Scotus, to give us this underlying harmony. And so in this video, I want to take a look at Scotus's proof for the existence of God. The reason that this proof is so important to study is, first of all, that it's a very, very strong proof for the existence of God. He manages to take lots and lots of different proofs that have been laid down thousands of years in this tradition of philosophy, and he integrates them into one coherent whole and one very strong argument, so that the best arguments, the metaphysical efficiency, and an ontological status of God's necessity, and put those forward as his primary argument, but then is able to take all the other arguments for the existence of God and allow them to illuminate for us the different attributes of God. And what's interesting then is that Scotus doesn't call this first principle God until he's firmly established that it's personal, that it has intellect and will.
And so he thinks you could only get with the basic arguments to the existence of some sort of first principle, but he wants to show not only some first principle, but the actual God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Joseph, that truly revealed himself to us. And so that's why he wants to show that it's a personal God. And so Scotus himself is well aware of this. When people act like Scotus has divorced himself from the biblical tradition, you can just go read Scotus and see that that's not the case. And so he articulated in four different works his proof for the existence of God. The one I'm primarily going to be following is his last iteration of it in the Ordinatio, because it's the most developed. But I will be drawing from his earlier proofs for the existence of God to help illuminate what he's saying in the Ordinatio. And so I want to start off with this wonderful prayer he puts in the De Primo Principio that shows how anchored he actually is to the biblical tradition when he's making this argument. Start with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord our God, true teacher that you are, when Moses your servant asked you for your name that he might proclaim it to the children of Israel, you, knowing what was in the mind of mortals could grasp of you, replied, I am who I am, thus disclosing your blessed name. You are truly what it means to be. You are the whole of what it means to exist. This, if it is possible for me, I should like to know by way of demonstration. Help me then, O Lord, as I investigate how much our natural reason can learn about that truth true being which you are, if we begin with the being which you have predicated of yourself. So now I want to take a look at how Scotus actually makes his argument in his proof for the existence of God. And by looking at this brief outline, when we're then looking at each individual part of his argument, we can understand how those parts fit into the whole and not get lost down in the weeds. Because Scotus's proof for the existence of God goes on for a few dozen pages. I will link below his proof for the existence of God in the Ordinatio. And you'll see it goes on three pages in the online version. But if you go and try and print that out as I did as I was preparing this, you'll see it goes on for dozens of pages. And some of his other proofs go on even further. In the De Primo Principio, he goes on for something like 30 pages in his proof for the existence of God. And so the first thing he does in his proof for the existence of God is to show a metaphysical efficient causality. And I'll explain in a minute what exactly is meant by a metaphysical efficient causality rather than some other sort of type of efficient causality. But this is really important to show because this will be the basis of his proof. And he wants to go on from that then to talk about the possibility of the first principle. So one possible objection that could be raised to cosmological arguments is, well, we don't know how we can move from these contingent principles of the world to a necessary first being. So what I mean by that is, that when we look around the world, that the world around us, it's contingent things that are changing. And one thing that could be about the world is that it could possibly not exist. There could be nothing at all that exists that is created. And so how can we show that God would still exist to them? Because all we've shown is that if the world exists, then God must exist. And yes, we've shown that God actually exists to them because it's pretty easy to show that the physical world does actually exist. But what Scotus wants to do is take a step back and say, no, I can get rid of that premise. I don't have to show that the world actually has to exist. As long as we accept that it might exist, then it definitely God exists. And we can see by basic observation, by basic logic, that the world could possibly exist. And so he shows that God still has to exist then. But he's careful to only say at this point the first principle, because he doesn't want to say that this is God yet until we've actually shown what is this first principle that's God, as I talked about just before. And then he goes on to talk about other senses of primacy in this first principle. So we've already shown that it has a primacy of efficient causality. It causes the entire world to exist. 
but there's more than simply causing the world to exist. He wants to show also that it is the end of all things and all created things are directed to this first principle. And then he also wants to show a primacy of eminence, that the first principle is absolutely perfect and all th other things are less perfect and are only have perfections in comparison to the first principle who is infinitely perfect. From there he goes on to show the singularity of the first principle and to show how we can't have multiple first principles, that's contradictory, and why polytheism can't possibly be true. In the Ordinatio, he actually devotes a whole separate question to disproving polytheism, but if we simply stick with question two of book one, which is where he makes the arguments against um, the existence of multiple gods, in this part within his proof for the existence of God, we don't have to go on to question three where he makes the argument more in detail. I think he already makes it convincingly in question two, and so I'm only going to focus on that section. But if you want to continue on reading Scotus from here, I think that would be a great spot to go to and see his more extended arguments against the existence of multiple gods. From there, he goes on to discussing the absolute properties of the first principle. And this is where he begins to talk about the first principle as God and divine. Because he first shows that it must have intellect and will. And at this point, we're to a personal being, because it has to be able to think and freely choose. One of the big parts of Scotus is he wants to emphasize the real free will of God, which often gets him accused of a voluntarism that develops in Occam and some of the reformers. But if we understand what Scotus means by the genuine freedom of the will, we'll see that while he can be called a voluntarist in some sense, if voluntarism just means the freedom of the will to move itself and it's not merely an appetite of the intellect, that the will isn't an arbitrary moving. It's still heavily connected to the intellect because it takes the principles from the intellect and moves freely based on those. I'm going to do a whole future video on human psychology, according to Scotus, because this is where a lot of misunderstandings of Scotus really develop. And from there, we're going to look at divine simplicity in Scotus. So Scotus says that the intellect and the will are identical to the divine essence because of a series of arguments he makes. And it's actually not at all the approach to simplicity that Aquinas comes to. Yes, Scotus wants to say there's not multiple parts within God, but the approach he takes to it is very different, which allows him to formulate a sense of divine simplicity, which fits as a middle ground between Pelobites, who might want to say there's a real distinction within God, and Thomists, who want to say that all the properties of God are identical. With the Thomists, Scotus will affirm that all the properties of God are identical to the divine essence. But with the Pelobites, he'll caution against saying that all the different properties of God are identical to one another, because then they really mean the same thing. Now, the Thomists don't want to say it means the same thing, of course. They want to say there's a virtual distinction. But Scotus really gives us the metaphysics to explain why through a formal distinction and specifically a modal version of the formal distinction. I'll explain all of this when we get to those later parts within the video. He then gets on to other things that flow from it. So we have an omnipotence of God, that God's will is not limited by anything, and an omniscience, that God's intellect is not limited by anything, and a foreknowledge, that if God knows all things, he knows things even before they begin to exist, and he even knows things that could not exist. He knows all things, and Scotus will actually make a distinction between God's knowing of things that he will actually make and God's knowing of things that he could have made but doesn't. This is a very similar distinction to what's made in the Byzantine tradition in Maximus the Confessor between the Logi, what God really does make and knows that he will make, and you know, the divine ideas of things that God could have made, but decides not to make. And I'll go into that in more detail later on, both in this video and a later video, because in both Scotus and in Maximus the Confessor, this concept of the foreknowledge of things God really will make is very, very tied to the person of Christ and their theology of creation. And so I'll go into that in a later video that I make on the absolute primacy of Christ within creation. And then finally, the most important principle 
for SCOTUS of God is divine infinity, that God is absolutely infinite and not mathematically infinite. And we'll go on to discuss the differences between mathematical and absolute infinity. And finally, after all of this, SCOTUS really thinks we've proved something that we can call God. So yes, with intellect and will, we can begin to call this God. But really, we can't fully call it God until we've reached all the different properties of the first principle. And so, this will be the structure of the proof as we move through it. And so, Scotus, while he's drawing on the entire tradition, I think we can say in particular he's drawing on St. Bonaventure, because the three different premises that Scotus wants to ascribe to um, the first principle, and the three ways in which he goes about proving the first principle, are Bonaventure's three arguments, and he's going to take Bonaventure's three arguments and combine them into one argument. Now, if you want to look where Bonaventure makes these arguments, it's on dis in the disputed questions on the mystery of the Trinity in the first part of the first article. And so the three parts that Bonaventure lays out is he actually starts with finality. So Bonaventure doesn't look at finality in the strict sense of this can absolutely prove God. Rather, he looks for a fittingness to the existence of God. So he shows we desire truth, and God is the greatest truth. So our desiring of God shows that our desiring of truth rather shows the existence of God. Likewise, our desiring of love, our desiring of goodness, and he lists out ten different things that we desire that show that God must exist from that. Now, this proof really begins in Aristotle, because Aristotle doesn't show the existence of God so much with efficient causality. He does a little bit, and it's debated. Um, David Bradshaw has a very good treatment of um, Aristotle's argument for the efficient causality of God, and David Bradshaw does think there's really an argument for efficient causality within Aristotle. But it's an argument from motion, not an argument from metaphysical efficiency. And so this isn't really the same type of thing that Scotus is talking about, as I'll go on in a minute. But the version that Bonaventure wants to talk about is really more found in Augustine. He cites Augustine over and over again in this section. Now, this probably goes back to earlier Platonists. Um, I'm not really all that knowledgeable on the Platonist tradition. I know a little bit about it. So if people who do know a lot more about Platonism want to comment below of which Platonist it's in, I think I remember it even being in Plato. But the version that Bonaventure is working with is really from Augustine. And then the next step that Bonaventure will take is looking at efficient causality and specifically at metaphysical efficient causality, that God causes the world to actually exist from not actually existing. And the first person I'm aware of to make this argument is Avicenna. It might go back earlier, I'm pretty sure it does, but I know it from Avicenna. And it's probably most famously articulated, actually, by Thomas Aquinas in the De Ente et Ascentium. And it's unfortunately very frequently looked over in Thomas Aquinas. A lot of people look at the five ways for God in the Summa Theologica, but he's drawing actually here on some simpler proofs that he thinks are easier to grasp. But if you look into his more metaphysical works, he actually thinks that metaphysical efficient causality is a much better proof for the existence of God, even if it's much harder to wrap your head around. And then finally, we have the ontological necessity of Anselm. Bonaventure heavily cites Anselm in his section on ontological necessity. And it's here, actually, Scotus goes to citing authorities, where he doesn't cite authorities very much. He cites Avicenna and Averroes a little bit. But the main authority he really cites throughout the work is Anselm when he gets to the sections. He wants to clear Anselm's name from the critiques of Thomas Aquinas. And he shows that Thomas Aquinas really misdirects his criticism of Anselm. Because Anselm doesn't say we can really grasp the divine essence. Rather, he's saying we can show that the divine essence must necessarily exist in itself. And this is the last way that Bonaventure himself uses. And so if we actually look in Bonaventure, we have a sort of movement that we look from the fittingness of God, we desire God, and so we want to look now, does God exist because we desire God? It only makes sense that God would exist. And we can look at the world around us, as St. Paul says, and show that God must exist because of the existence of the world.
And then we can move from that to showing God's necessary existence, that if we think about what it means for God to be God, what it means for infinite being to be infinite being, infinite being cannot not be. And this is really the greatest proof for the existence of God, but it's hardest to grasp. And so this is why Scotus leaves this argument as sort of a closing note on his argument. And this is why I think it's good to understand Bonaventure. This even relates to a general theme in Bonaventure of a triple way of ascent to God. So we have the cleansing of the intellect and the cleansing of the memory and the cleansing of the will. We have faith, hope, and charity. We have purification, illumination, divinization. We have a general threefold way. And as I'm going to show in the series on biblical theology... We have a movement from priest to king to prophet that's central in the biblical themes. This is actually a very deeply biblical theme that St. Bonaventure is drawing on and Scotus is drawing on. I'm not actually sure if they did recognize the connection of priest, king, and prophet. I haven't noticed if they make that connection there, but I think this shows a deep harmony between what they're thinking and what scripture is thinking. And if they're actually not getting this principle word for word from scripture, how much the more does it show that they're correct? Because it shows we can reach this truth both by faith and by reason. Now, Scotus is here giving a proof from metaphysical causality. So what Scotus is not saying is things in terms of motion. Motion in classical philosophy simply means change. So he's not saying that things change therefore God exists, but he's rather saying that something has to give the principle of existence, um, what St. Thomas Aquinas' essay, the being, to a thing. Now, I don't think Scotus has the exact same understanding of the relationship between essence and existence as in Thomas. If people are interested in this subject, I could make another video on it. I probably will make a video talking about the essence-existence distinction when I talk about Scotus's doctrine of creation. But the same overall principle is still happening, that things have to move from existing only in the mind of God to actually existing. And this is really what Scotus wants to talk about, not why do things change, but why does something exist rather than nothing. Now, before I go on and talk about why we might want to make such a proof, I just want to read what Scotus himself says in the Lectura. Now, efficient cause, this is quoting from Scotus here. Now, efficient causality can be considered either as a metaphysical or as a physical property. The metaphysical property is more extensive than the physical, for to give existence to another is of a broader scope than to give existence by way of movement or change. And even if all existence were given in the latter fashion, the notion of the one is still not that of the other. It is not efficiency as a physical attribute, however, but efficiency as a, the metaphysician considers it that proves a more effective way of proving God's existence. For there are more attributes in metaphysics than in physics whereby the existence of God can be established. It can be shown, for example, from composition and simplicity, from act and potency, from one and many from those features which are the properties of being. Wherefore, if you find one extreme of the disjunction imperfectly realized in a creature, you can conclude that the alternative, the perfect extreme, exists in God. Averroes, therefore, in attacking Avicenna at the end of Book I of the Physics, is incorrect to claim that to prove the uh, existence of God is the job of the physicist alone, because this can be established only by way of motion and in no other way, as if, the as if metaphysics begins with a conclusion which was not evident in itself but needed to be proved in physics. In point of fact, however, God's existence can be shown more truly in a greater variety of ways by means of those metaphysical attributes which characterize being. This proof lies in that the first effective cause, or first efficient cause rather, imparts not merely this fluid existence called motion, but existence in an unqualified sense, which is more perfect and widespread." End quote. Uh, this quote from the lecturer, I'm drawing it from Jeremy Daggett's um, essay on Scotus's proof for the existence of God, which was heavily influential in creating this video. I highly recommend that essay and the whole collection of essays that comes in called The Spirit in the Church. That whole book is a really wonderful introduction to Scotism. But anyways, going back here, the reason that Scotus wants to uh, 
approach with metaphysical causality is not because you can't show that there must be some sort of first principle which causes motion. He seems to think that that is the case. Rather, he thinks that it allows the revelation of not merely a first mover, but a being with metaphysical properties, that we can actually show what this first principle we're talking about is. And that's why this is important to approach. It also demonstrates the univocity of the concept of being, frequently just called the univocity of being, through the disjunctive transcendentals. This is another area where Scotus is highly misunderstood and quite slandered, especially by John Milbank and the whole radical orthodoxy movement. Just a brief note here. If you see anybody studying radical orthodoxy, John Milbank, Catherine Pickstock, just completely ignore what they're writing. They never actually cite a single work of SCOTUS. If they do, it's a single line. Um, plenty of people have completely debunked John Milbank's project. I think um, Michael Horan, now Father Dan Horan, has a detailed book refuting what Milbank thinks SCOTUS means by univocity. But within this video, I'll even address what univocity is, and specifically through the disjunctive transcendentals, which SCOTUS just laid out here. All right, so now I'm going to begin to actually look at the particular arguments within the proof. If you'd like to follow along, I'll have a link to a question to uh, book one of the Ordinatio in the description. And so at some spots within the video, I'll summarize Scotus's argument in a new way because it's a little difficult to understand. But here I'm going to just lay out Scotus's argument word for word as he gives it. And... Yeah, so let's begin. I also have reformulated it into a series of steps, just so it's a little bit easier to follow. So, premise one, some being can be an effect. Premise two, an effect of itself, then, or of nothing, or of something else. Premise three, not of nothing, because that which is nothing is the cause of nothing. Premise four, nor of itself, because there is nothing that makes or generates itself. Five, therefore, of something else. Premise six, let this something else be A. Premise seven, if A is the first way expounded, I have the proposition intended. If not, then it is effectively derivatively. It is effective derivatively because it can be the effect of another or cause of an effect by virtue of another. For if a negation is denied, the affirmation is asserted. Premise 8. Let that other be granted and let it be B, about which one argues as was a, about A, and thus either one proceeds ad infinitum, where each thing will be second in respect to a prior, or else one stops at something which has no prior. Premise 9. But an infinity is impossible in ascending causes. Premise 10. Therefore, premise C is necessary. So to summarize what Scotus is saying here, he's saying that something there's something can be an effect it then has to be either it's from itself it's from nothing or it's from something else that's just exhausting all the possibilities uh being from itself or from something else if it's an effect is absurd uh something can't come into existence out of nothing by its own cause and likewise something can't come out of nothing from nothing. And so something else has to bring this thing into existence. And remember, we're not saying into existence by way of another, but into existence by way of existence itself, to give existence to, not to give existence out of some prior existing thing. And so we're going to say that this is A then. And so we can either say that, well, it's we already have our first principle, or we can say okay, A is caused by B, in which case we just go back continuously, and Scotus is going to argue that there can't be an infinity of ascending causes, and therefore there has to be some first cause. Now, the first obvious objection is, why can't there be an infinite series of causes? You know, why can't we just go back ad infinitum into the beginning? And Scotus makes the important distinction here between essentially or per se ordered series of causes and accidentally, also called per accidens, ordered series of causes. So per se is just Latin for from itself or accidentally um, through another. So we're seeing either that there's a series of causes in which the actual 
causation comes from a first principle or the causation is given to another. And so the first only accidentally causes the third. Now, this is a little confusing to understand. So I'm going to give an analogy here. That's basically the textbook analogy given. Now, the first analogy is not given by SCOTUS, but the second one is actually explicitly given by SCOTUS. So an example of an essentially ordered series of causes would be a hand pushing a stick, pushing a rock. On the other hand, an accidentally ordered series of causes would be a grandfather begetting a father, begetting a son. So let's consider the second one, an accidentally ordered series of causes. Scotus says that there can very well be an infinite series of accidentally ordered causes. All right. A grandfather begets a father. If that grandfather dies, he disapproves of his father having a son. No matter what that grandfather does, short of killing the father, obviously, but any person could do that. But the grandfather, as a grandfather, once he begets a son, that son can now become a father by begetting a son. The grandfather's causality is not necessary for the father to beget the son. So you could theoretically have an infinite line of genealogies. On the other hand, with a hand pushing a stick, pushing a rock, right? If the hand stops pushing the stick, the rock will stop being pushed. The stick will just drop to the ground. The stick doesn't actually have a causal power within itself. It's given that causal power by the hand. And so, we can deduce some important things about a per se series of causes to show that it is this type of causality we're talking about. So the first thing is that the uh, per se series depends for its causing on the first, right? So if a hand pushes a stick, which pushes a rock, which maybe pushes a blade of grass bending underneath it, and then that grass, uh, maybe let's say it's pushing a root, and then that root gets pulled up and it pulls up some dirt, the dirt being pulled up is only being pulled up because the hand. And so the hand has all the causal power in the series. Well, if you have a genealogical line, like, you know, King David doesn't have to will that Jesus be born in order for Jesus to be born because there's a whole series of steps in between. And so we're saying that God has to will at every second of existence. Of course, God's in eternity, so God's not willing at a series of existences, but once from eternity, but with respect to time, there's a series of existences. And so God is constantly willing that the universe exists, because if God stopped willing at any second that the universe exists, the universe would cease to exist. So we're not talking here about creation ex nihilo from a point in time in Genesis 1 when God says, um, God created the heavens and the earth, let there be light, and so on and so forth. We're not talking about that. We're talking about God's willing that the universe exists in the first place. And in the first place at every time, in the first place as a logical step, not as a temporal step. And so there's also a necessarily required simultaneity for the cause. And I'm, I'm drawing these words here actually directly out of Scotus. Scotus is very, very clear when he's talking about these two. And Thomas Aquinas uses essentially versus accidentally ordered series of causes, but he doesn't talk about it in the Summa. And so you get these dumb people like the amazing atheist who will say, you know, why can't there be an infinite series of causes? Just read what else Aquinas wrote. But setting that aside, Scotus here lays out these answers very clearly. Likewise, for TJ's other objection, TJ's the amazing atheist, for his other objection, he says, why can't it be a blueberry muffin that caused everything? First of all, just flip to the next page of the Summa and you'll know why. But setting that aside, that he can't seem to read more than one page, um, probably didn't even read Aquinas himself, but setting that aside, Scotus here will give why it can't be a blueberry muffin in his own proof, you know? Amazing Atheist had bothered to read Scotus, maybe he'd be a Scotist right now, I don't think so. Um, I don't think he has the reading attention for that. <laughs> but setting that aside, um, we can see why here essentially an accidentally ordered series are important to talk about, and so it's really good, I think, that Scotus makes it so clear why this is and lays it out very clearly within the proof itself. And then finally, the last 
thing of a per se series is that it includes the causality of a second nature and a second order because the superior cause is more perfect, right? So what does that mean? That it basically is saying that the first cause in the series has to be more perfect in respect to the causality. So we don't tend to think of a hierarchy of perfections in the modern world, but that's how everyone before the modern world thought of things. The great chain of being going all the way down to an atom, which would be at the bottom of the great chain of being, all the way up to God, who is the cause of all things, and is in himself has causality, and so he is most perfect, he's at the highest, the great chain of being, he exists to a greater degree than anything else. And so that's what we're saying here by a more superior cause, is that God has this power of causality that the universe doesn't have. So going back to the example of a hand pushing a stick, pushing a rock, the hand alone has the power of causality here. And so it is more superior in respect to causality. Even if you have, right, a per person A pushes over person B, who then topples on a person C, so person C falls over, you might say, well, maybe person C is actually a way stronger person than person A. But in respect to the causality going on here, they are not giving the causal power. Only person A is giving the causal power. And so they're more, most superior in respect to this causality here. And even if Scotus says you want to have a paraacciden series of infinity, so Scotus will fully grant that maybe Aristotle was right, that the universe could be infinite. And so if you're just going by natural reason, maybe you could believe the universe is infinite. Uh, St. Bonaventure doesn't think so. St. Thomas Aquinas does think so. So there was some disagreement within the scholastics about the possibility of an infinite universe. But they all granted that revelation showed that there is not an infinite universe, unlike in Islamic scholasticism, where you got the idea that philosophically there's an infinite universe, and theologically there's not an infinite universe, and those are just contradictory truths. Um, the Christian scholastics reject this double truth theory that many of the Islamic scholastics come up with. And I think that shows that there's a great harmony between faith and reason within Christian revelation and natural philosophy because they didn't have to throw out these things. They could always come up with answers to these objections. Well, in a lot of Islamic philosophy, they had trouble reconciling the Quran with natural philosophy. And so many of them did just come up with this double truth theory. But we have here, he says, let's say we have a grandfather begets a father, begets a son who begets another son, so on and so forth. And this has been going on for all eternity, you know, 10 quadrillion years ago, there were humans that were causing them. Well, there is now human nature. Well, where does human nature come from? Human nature has to come in essentially, right? Because it has to, ha it doesn't have the explanation for its source in itself. And so we still have to have an essentially ordered series of causes as the basis for any Parachidens ordered series of causes. The two aren't opposed. Rather, the Parachidens requires an essentially ordered series to explain where that causality and that nature came in from the first place. And even in our current secular account of human history, right, where it goes back and you'll find some scientists who will respond, someone like William Lane Craig, who's a Christian apologist, and will say, the Big Bang caused the existence of the world, the Big Bang would have had to be caused by God, therefore God exists. And some atheist scientists like Sean Carroll have objected. Um, that this is just a repetition of Immanuel Kant's argument, well, there will never be an Isaac Newton for a blade of grass, and then we got evolution that explained how grass came about, and so William Lane Craig is just saying there will never be, or there will not be an Immanuel Kant, there will never be a Charles Darwin, this was Immanuel Kant's argument. And so basically, he's saying that there will never be a... Isaac Newton, rather. Sorry. Sorry I made that confusing. Immanuel Kant's argument that there will be an ever be an Isaac Newton for a blade of grass because Newton came around and explained physics. And then we got Charles Darwin who came in and explained evolution. He explained how the great blade of grass came to be. And so William Lane Craig's argument now is basically there will never be an Immanuel, there will never be an Isaac Newton for the universe. The repetition of Immanuel Kant's argument. Sorry, I sometimes go on tangents here and get a little lost. Um, I don't have the time to go through and edit all these videos in extreme detail. I do a little bit of editing, but 
I would not have possibly have the time to make these videos, so hopefully you can endure a little bit of these side tangents. So going on to this then, Sean Carroll's objection basically is, well, we eventually will discover what caused the Big Bang. It will be something physical, and we can just keep going back in a series. And Scotus would go, well, wait a second. How did matter come to be not as a parachidens series, not as motion, but essentially, why is there something rather than nothing? You still need a per se causality, and a per se causality cannot be infinite because the first cause in the series imparts the causality. None of the other elements have within themselves a causality, and so it would be absurd to say there's an infinite series, and this is like turtles all the way down. Now, right, there has to be a first thing which gives the causality to everything else in the series. Um, and so that's why Scotus says there can't be an infinite series of ascending causes. He's saying here essentially ordered causes. So now Scotus wants to take up the issue of contingency, right? So the universe could possibly not exist. That's basic Christian revelation. Um, some of the Muslim philosophers that I mentioned rejected this possibility that the universe could not exist and said that it was necessary that God create, but then the universe would just be another God and you end up with pantheism. So this clearly can't be the case. In order for the universe to not be God, the universe has to have the possibility of not existing. And so we want to go back now, right? We sing the universe is contingent. Now, if the universe exists, then God exists. Well, now we're saying that God only exists on this condition of the universe existing. The universe could not exist. Now, we, the universe does actually exist, and so we can say, and even if we want to grant the universe doesn't exist, we can say, well, our minds exist, they're conscious, that's the thing we want to talk about, what caused our minds to exist. And the mind can't be an illusion because an illusion requires an observer. Anyways, so we can now say from the universe existing that God must actually exist. We've already granted that God actually exists. But why does God necessary? That's really, I think, more the question that Scotus is getting to. Is not is even physical motion, he seems to think, could theoretically prove some first principle. But he really wants to try and get to with this proof, what do we mean when we say God? And so he wants to show why God is necessary. And he's going to make a series of arguments for this. But his main one is he wants to say that we can actually reformulate a cosmological argument from efficient causality in an ontological sense. Now, Scotus's argument for this can be a little difficult to follow, so I'm going to rephrase it. Here we go. If it is possible that something exists, then it is necessary that it is possible that it exists. Premise two, it is possible that something exists. Premise three, therefore, it is necessary that it is possible that something exists. Premise four, if something exists, then there must be a first principle that caused it. Now, this is just what we already proved. It's in number 43 of the Ordinatio. Premise 5. If the cause of B's existence is A, then A must exist for B to possibly exist. Premise 6. Therefore, if it is possible that something exists, then the first principle must exist. Premise 7. Therefore, the first principle must necessarily exist. Now, what's going on here a little bit? It can be very hard to grasp what Scotus is arguing here, but I think once you see it, it's very hard to unsee. It took me, like, hours and hours of reading Scotus and commentaries on Scotus to grasp what Scotus is saying here. So if you are very confused at first, don't be concerned. I was very confused at first. And I'm going to try and phrase it as clearly as I can, and hopefully... This makes it clear for you. If it's not clear, read up what I put on the screen again and again. Um, you can go read Jeremy Daggett's accounts of it in the Spirit in the Church. And just think about it for a while of what Scotus is saying so you can really grasp it. And I think if you really grasp this, it's a very strong proof for the existence of God. So I'm going to go walk through each premise and show what Scotus is saying. So if it is possible that something exists, then it is necessary that it is possible that it exists. What in the world does that mean? What we're saying, right, is that we're not saying that it's necessary that the universe exists, but that its possibility is necessary. Well, how can we know that its possibility is necessary? Well, first of all, we observe that the universe exists, and so if that's 
a very strong empirical argument for the possibility of its necessity. But we can also see that there's no contradiction between its necessity and whether it's um, actual existence and its theoretical existence. There's nothing in the existence of created things that should imply that they're not possible. Um, and so Scotus really wants to throw it on the objector. If the objector wants to say that it's impossible that things exist, you know, this objector can try and prove why that's the case. But there's nothing on the surface that should make it seem like the two contradict. And so, right, we want to grant not that the possibility itself is necessary, but that it's Rather that not that the actual thing itself is necessary, but that the possibility is necessary. And now we're going to be arguing from necessary conditions to another necessary condition, God's own existence. And so we're not moving from contingency to necessity. Rather, we're moving from necessity to necessity. It's a really brilliant move on the part of Scotus. Now, it's possible that something exists, as I just mentioned. Therefore, it's necessary that it is possible that something exists. That's all SCOTUS is saying here. Now we have this principle of necessity. Now we've already granted that if something exists, there must be a first principle that caused it. That was what we already showed. Um, so if the cause of B's existence is A, then A must exist for B to possibly exist, right? So what we're saying here, right, is that, right, this is really just a restatement of four in many ways. We're saying that, right, if B, if A causes B, then A must exist for B to possibly exist. That's also what we showed really in number 43 and with the essentially ordered series of causes because A imparts the causality not to be directly, but rather it causes B to exist without giving that actual principle of causality itself. And so we can follow from this that if it is possible that something exists, then the first principle must exist. Now what does that mean, right? We're saying that the necessity of the possibility exists. And so right, if that necessity exists, the first principle must be the cause of that necessity. And so if we're going to grant that it's possible that something exists, then the first principle must cause that existence. And therefore, the first principle must necessarily exist. Because we're saying, right, that it's possible the universe exists. The only thing that could cause it to exist is God, or the first principle, as Scotus states it here still. And so that first principle must exist in order to even give that possibility the pos its actual possibility, and it's necessary that that possibility exists, so therefore the first principle must exist. This is a, I'm trying to state it as clearly as I can, because it's a very hard concept to wrap your mind around, but I think if you stop and think about it for a few minutes, it will start to make more sense, because it's a very different way of talking about things. Scotus is often accused of departing from the classical tradition by talking about possibility too much. But I actually think this is a really brilliant move on the part of Scotus. Scotus is giving us an answer to modern objectors who want to talk about possibility. Scotus is actually probably the greatest defender of the classical tradition because he's able to think of objections that haven't even really been argued before, and it's able to already give us responses to them, that we don't have to deny discussion of possible existence. We can talk about possible existence, which modern philosophers will want to, and still get to these classical conclusions. And so this is a really useful tool that SCOTUS gives us. Thank you for listening to this first part of the introduction to SCOTUSM. In part two, we will begin to look at the divine attributes as SCOTUS moves on to discuss those within his proof.